Добрый день, коллеги. Приветствуем вас на презентации 5 и 2 в 2023 году ежеквартального отчета «Белорусский трекер перемен» совместного аналитического доклада, который готовят раз в квартал шесть экспертов. И сегодня его результаты представят Павел Слюнкин, ассоциированный аналитик Европейского совета по международным отношениям. Павел, здравствуйте. Добрый вечер. Артем Шрайбман, основатель агентства Sense Analytics. Артем, добрый вечер. Добрый, добрый. Филипп Беканов, независимый социолог. Здравствуйте, Филипп. Добрый вечер. Геннадий Коршунов, программный директор Белорусской академии, старший аналитик Центра новых идей. Геннадий, здравствуйте. Витаю, шановное господарство. И Лев Львовский, академический директор Бюрок. Здравствуйте, Лев. Витаю. Коллеги, напоминаю, что сегодня у нас есть перевод на английский язык, и если вам удобнее слушать презентацию по-английски, вы можете переключиться на него в настройках вашего Zoom. Это в нижней строке настроек. Нужно найти кнопку Interpretation и переключиться на тот язык, на котором вам... Select the language you prefer. The format of today's evening is the following. First, experts present the reports, or the parts of the report, then we'll have the Q&A session. You can ask your questions with the voice by turning on the microphone or write them in the chat. First, I would like to give a floor a welcoming word to Christopher Forst, head of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation. Thank you very much. Um, and Welcome everyone to today's launch. First of all, sorry if you hear some music in the background, a concert just started in front of my window, but those other things that happen in Zoom times, just ignore if so. Um, so I'd like to welcome you in the name of uh, AVS. AVS is Germany's oldest political foundation um, committed to the values of social democracy. And by now I can say a proud supporter of the Belarus Change Tracker. Um, the publication you'll be able to find in our digital library. It will be posted later on here as well and on our brand new website, belarus.avs. De, along with some other publications. Um, it's been exactly one year since uh, the first edition was published. Actually, the work obviously started a bit earlier. I hope this will make it possible to have a bit more of a comprehensive analysis of trends also over time. Uh, that was the idea from the very beginning when the very first Belarus Change Tracker was launched. Um, it has become a flagship project for us, I must say. It's the fifth edition with AVS support. Very much hope that there will be more editions for us. It will unfortunately be the last edition we can support for now, as our resources are currently limited. But I very much hope uh, that there will be further editions that they will nonetheless be realized and will definitely remain fans of the Belarus Change Tracker. Um, the first sentence of this edition actually makes pretty clear why. It's a catchy phrase, but it's also just 100% true. Belarus is going through the most turbulent period since its independence, uh, and that still is the case. Um, in recent months, we once again have seen uh, very important um, events, for example, the um, potential, let's say, still say potential deployment of nuclear weapons uh, from Russia to Belarus, uh, the worsening conditions of political prisoners and many other topics that don't always make the headlines every day, but that's also why we have such a um, com um, coherent uh, and, and longer analysis here at hand. Again, our team will also present a public opinion poll with some uh, hopefully interesting results on recent developments, including, by the way, uh, nuclear weapon deployment, um, and many more things will be analyzed in this edition that you will be able to find online and that will be presented today. Um, I have to say that I'm aware that there is much attention and readers everywhere for the Belarus Change Tracker, including, for example, embassies. Requests to us regularly show that. Um, we hope for an even bigger fan base in the future. Um, so I'm very optimistic that once again, the publication will find a lot of readers and would like to thank the team uh, for this uh, great piece of work. Um, one last sentence maybe before I finish my starting remarks. It's an all-male panel today. Uh, it used to be at least one female author, uh, which now unfortunately dropped out. Um, hope this will change in the future again. Uh, it's uh, not something we usually uh, like to see and I very much regret that. Uh, but nonetheless, we have five great uh, male experts. Um, so. Thanks to the researchers, uh, thanks to my colleague Taras uh, once again, and thanks to the Press Club uh, for making today's event possible. And over to you again, looking forward.
Спасибо вам, Кристофер. Thank you, Christopher. So let's now move to the presentation. And the section dedicated to foreign policy will be presented by Pavel Slunkin. Pavel, please, the floor is yours. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining us today. I would like to start by saying that I'm sorry that we have only male panel. It so happened because our wonderful researcher Katerina Bardukova, whom I would like to thank for being with us all the time, presented, she presented the economic part. Unfortunately, though, she'll be dealing with other things in the future. She will not be part of our team in the future. Still, me personally and us would like to thank her sincerely for the contribution that she made into our work. Thus, it's all male panel today. I'm sorry again for this. Now, let's uh, talk about the topic of our today's discussion about the trends. I'll try to be brief and uh, tell you about the main trends that I cover in the foreign policy section of the report. Undoubtedly, the main one is the is that Belarusian Russian military cooperation has this nuclear dimension. The sides recently signed the agreement which stipulates the transfer and uh, conditions of keeping nuclear weapons in Belarus. For Belarus, it will have undoubtedly certain consequences if this happens. The sides are trying to figure out who will be controlling the nuclear weapons in Belarus if it needs supposed to be used, but from the point of view of our experts, uh, we believe that the uh, statements by Alexander Lukashenko are false and the control will be in Russia, thus putting territory of Belarus in risk, into risk. Will be uh, also uh, uh, Belarusian people will not be able to influence the situation. Uh, the, uh, Second trend is the limitations of the border. While on the previous trackers, we highlighted the fact that there, are, there is a new iron curtain being created in the western part, the western border of Belarus. In this tracker, this section, we noticed that for the first time, these limitations appeared in the east of the country on the border with Russia, particularly after the over forced groups, military uh, groups coming from the Ukrainian side and uh, doing some sabotage things. Lukashenko decided to introduce control at the border in the eastern border of Belarus, which closes the circle that was uh, slowly being created around Belarus. Uh, all of a sudden, it, it appeared in the east of the country. That was quite a surprise, personally, for me. At the same time, Alexander Lukashenko, in continuation of the trend we mentioned, the previous trend tracker, he is uh, trying to find more foreign partners or partners abroad, of whom the majority, just like those in authorities, have uh, a doubtful you know, in international. Uh, reputation, uh, there are some of them are under sanctions and in isolation. There were public meetings of Belarusian officials in the last three months, covered by this trigger with uh, Nicaragua, Zimbabwe, Pakistan, Russia, Hungary, and Russian occupation administration representatives. The most interesting here would be the visit of the Donetsk uh, region representative, occupation forces. Pushilin, and the fact that he met with Alexander Lukashenko. Previously, he did come to Central Belarus, but in the, at the time, he was uh, accepted in the lower level, at the lower level, which testifies to the fact that now we are witnessing the erosion of the Belarusian sovereignty, particularly in the foreign direction. And uh, the relationship of Belarus with uh, occupied territories 
is not much different from the cooperation of Belarus with the fully-fledged states. The new trend that we have noticed in the last three months is that the international organizations, a number of them, are make, trying to formalize the responsibility of those authorities and Alexander Lukashenko for the crimes happening in Ukraine. OSCE for the third time launched regarding Belarus the Moscow mechanism. In its report, it recognized the fact that there was a deportation of uh, Ukrainian children into Russia and Belarus calling it uh, the crimes against humanity. The, the parliamentary assembly of OSCE also called for joining Alexander Lukashenko personally for uh, these crimes committed on, on his personal order. Another trend that we noticed, which is quite symbolic, is that in the European Union there's been a growing pool of countries who are blocking the in, introduction of more severe sanctions towards Belarus, while the latest pool of sanctions, despite the bad dynamics of in Belarus, that we've seen the involvement of war and the challenge of this to the regional security. The latest sanctions package was uh, passed by the EU more than a year ago. There appear now in the European Union countries and blocks of countries that want these sanctions to be weakened the sanctions towards the Belarus regime. We also noticed, uh, after we noticed the, in the previous tracker, this slight, very weak balance between Ukraine and Belarusian authorities. This relationship got tense, particularly in the period that we are now reporting on, and there appeared the positive dynamics of relationship of democratic forces with the uh, Ukrainian force, Ukrainian authorities. Here we must highlight the fact that the, the initiative to introduce Alexander Lukashenko a name into Parliamentary Assembly of the a list came from the representative of Ukraine and uh, uh, Mr. Zelensky's statement in the past are different to what he's saying now about Belarus. For the first time, uh, there were handshake between Zelensky and Tikhanovsky. At the same time, the forces are widening institutional presence in the international organizations. For example, the Belarusian delegation was for the first time present at, in Reykjavik and the at the summit of, of parliamentary assembly. So the previous summit uh, took place in 2009, which was a big achievement, democratic forces. So the Belarusian delegation was represented not by the illegitimate authorities, but by the democratic forces. According to, uh, based on the result of this visit, the United States launched strategic dialogue with democratic forces. Yes, used this bilateral kind of relationship in the past, but seldomly. And it will be happening now at the level of the democratic forces, not the official representatives of the Russian regime. Here I stop. Thank you, Pavel. Now to, I would like to give floor to Mr. Artem Schreiben, who will tell us about the uh, domestic policy of Belarus in the last quarter. Thank you, Alina. I hope you can hear me well. This time, I have uh, three trends to present to you. One of them is no longer relevant between currently. I will start with it because in the, in the uh, spring, we noticed the end to the fragmentation and the democratic forces, some configuration that was appeared there as a result of the creation of the coordinating council and the six months of function of the cabinet became stable. At least it seemed like that at the time. 
and uh, the mutual rep uh, reproach level went down. While there is blocks of bullish in opposition, there is wings moved to the more substantial discussion of the issues, like the peaceful change of the uh, authorities, uh, the strategy of releasing political prisoners and coordinating council became one of the key platforms of these discussions. It generated many discussions. However, as we all know, outside our reporting period, this was no longer the case. And we will talk about this in the next tracker. There was a split and one of the leading Belarusian uh, organizations like BIPOL, we may still see consequences of this crisis and consequences of this crisis for the Tikhanovsky cabinet, the fragmentation of the democratic forces as the single organized, because I believe the crisis is uh, not over yet. However, spring became the time for when all these arguments quiet down. We know that all this conflict with certain efforts of the side and democratic subjects and agents, they shouldn't exist. This is not a permanent status of the democratic forces. More constructive and peaceful cooperation is possible. Moving to what was happening with the Belarusian officials and authorities in the spring showed two more trends that um, showed to us what was happening before in the past, but the new hues, new tints. Almost all trackers noticed the militarization of the those regime happening in various directions. First and foremost, it affected the uh, civil agencies, and this trend continued in the spring. There were amendments made into the forest code would allow the foresters to carry weapons. The parliament uh, is supposed to review the law on militia, which can appear in uh, turbulent times to help the law enforcement bodies. And on the 31st of May, the Minister of Defense, Mr. Hrenin, stated that not all the second secondary school pupils but the students will start to undergo the military preparation however this trend has a certain subtrend that we call, have called the securitization of the those internal policy until now the Russian authorities motivated uh, the pressure that they put on everything by the unsafe actions coming in from the, the NATO, CIA, Pentagon, and Poland. This, this uh, sounded cheap and implausible um, because the state officials used it to continue exercising pressure. Now it has changed. A number of diversions, uh, a number of sabotages in uh, Russia, in the border regions of Russia and Ukraine, and Machulishi activities and uh, various Ukrainian forces moving into the Russian territory using the drones to attack Moscow and the Kremlin in particular, an attempt sometimes um, successful in life on Belarusian Russian propagandists. It all showed that the risks to the security of Belarusian authorities are real. Pavel mentioned about that. Uh, it uh, ended up with uh, tightened control on the border with Russia. But not only this, there were multiple transfers of uh, military groups to strengthen Belarusian border. Uh, border control was introduced 
political uh, border control was strengthened as well. The control over the use of drones has been tightened, and the new bill is prepared, being prepared, which will probably ban the use of uh, physical persons to to use drones by physical persons, and some funny measures were also taken, like there were anti-tank tank measures created outside Gomel, near Gomel. The military uh, support to the railways was tightened. This is aimed at uh, playing against the real threat, not the virtual. Also, the activities of the KGB in the spring increased. Uh, they were aimed at, um, at, at counteracting the information uh, threats, cyber threats. So in March, they said they liquidated the terrorist with grenade. Nobody knows exactly what he wanted to blow up or which country he represented. In April, in the April, in April, some Russians were detained. There was no information about them apart the fact that they were aim, trying to bomb some administrative uh, buildings in Grodno. In May, some people were also detained for allegedly doing something in the cemeteries with uh, explosives. This was not all supported by the facts. This will pretty much look like the desire of KGB to rehabilitate themselves um, for the failure in Machurishi airport. But the context is creates, showing that the country is at the permanent risk of terrorist threats is fits very well into our trend that we mentioned. And the last trend that we I'll present to you is as follows. We have been saying for a long time that Russian programmental bloggers and activists have become more active in Belarus, particularly after the invasion of the Ukraine, and they by highlighting certain facts of uh, actions involved with uh, connected with person identity we're trying to attract the attention by the seal of the Sicily key and a launch repressions and they succeeded quite often this trend continues they brought down the monument to Larissa Genius these various activists the low-level activism also was noticed by us. But in the spring, I noticed that the administration of Lukashenko started becoming more active or proactive. It stopped being a peaceful observer, passive observer, particularly as far as the cultural and narrative is concerned. On the initiative of Lukashenko's administ administration and head of administration, Sergei Yanka, those in Latinka, Latin alphabet was cancelled uh, in the public signs, and the signs with it were brought down in Minsk, starting from May. Then Mr. Sergeyenko made a statement, public statement, about the review of the attitude to various historical public figures, to magnates of, of Radzivius, Kostyushka, Kalinowski, very quickly we started noticing that in libraries, the, the books about those people were being removed. The books that reflect the periods of history that is frowned upon by the local authorities and the propagandists. Moreover, this spin of the Russification trend was uh, seen in the political activities. And uh, we witness now the re-registration of political parties. When we understand which parties will remain, the Belarus party has uh, has already been registered with a pro-Russian leader, which has managed its initiatives. The program of cooperation with the Rasatrunista about the joint visit and. Uh, involving transferring Ukrainian children from the occupied Donbass to Belarus. They're not hiding that this platform is supported by Lukashenko. 
and represent the classical Russian world, which shows uh, this is a Russificator's activi Russification activities of the Lukashenko's administration that has not been dealing with this topic so proactively in the past. I think I'll stop here and be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Artem. Foreign uh, economic aspects and domestic economic aspects will be covered by Lev Lewowski. Hello, uh, thank you very much for joining us today. I would like to thank Christopher Forst and the Julie Hebert Foundation for the support in organizing this event. And I also must agree to what Pavel Slavkin said in the past that uh, undoubtedly, but unfortunately, my colleague left the project, so I have to present two sections on foreign and domestic economy. In the spring of 2023, they uh, made con conclusions of the 2022. Now, because the Belarusian data is mostly hidden, I mean, the economic data is hidden, we have to use the mirror statistics published by other countries. In 2022, Belarus lost almost all of the Ukrainian market and more than 52% of exports to the EU countries. And these two trade partners were mainly replaced by the grown export to China and Russia. Based on the, this compensation in 2022, Belarusian export figures went down by 20%. But in the first quarter of 2023, Belarus gained, caught up uh, with the trend, and now uh, the figures should be equal to the, those pre-war ones. In the foreign economy, for the year round, the main factor has been that new sanctions have not been introduced. The new sanctions continue to not be introduced. Based on the rumors that we hear from various sidelines, and including those in the EU, the main reason for not introduction of new sanctions is that the European Union and its countries cannot agree on the issue of the expert of Belarus and potassium fertilizers. The softening of sanctions uh, are lobbied by the West American countries and far south, particularly Brazil. They want this, but these measures are being lobbied by some European countries. Again, according to rumors, we're talking about Portugal and Spain. On the background of the, in the background of the rumors that some sanctions may be weakened, sanctions regarding potassium, burst potassium, and in the background of the certain successes of the using Russian logistical chains to export those potassium fertilizers, Nutrium, one of the main leaders in producing potassium export, increased the forecast of the about Belarusian potassium from 66 that were percent that were before the war or during the war that to 76. Another trend is ongoing that we noticed in the previous presentation of the tracker. It looks like they managed to uh, start exporting Belarusian oil products initially when the Russian invasion and aggression towards Ukraine started. This presupposed that it, was, it, it seemed that it would be difficult to redirect various oil products because Ukraine was the main non-premium market. But as uh, some officials blurted this spring, the turnover increased uh, 97 times this, this spring in uh, which is region. I think it's about 
the expert of Belarusian oil products. Incidentally, Belarus is back with its oil rent. In the, in the past, it means, meant that we bought oil from Russia cheaper and we resell, resold it at higher prices to various countries and Ukraine among them. Now the rent is that we're not buying at the lower prices from Russia and at discounts that are uh, highlighted by the cap mechanism. Now we're reselling it at the normal market prices based on the price of the Brent oil. According to some calculations, in 2022, those could have earned 1.7 billion of dollars additionally on using this rent. If this discount for the Russian oil continues in 2023, this benefit could be 2.7 billion US dollars. As I said, for a year, we haven't seen any large scale sanctions from the EU. Still, some countries continue to introduce uh, single sanctions. It was done by the USA, Canada, and South Korea in the spring. It's mostly done by Lithuania and Poland these days, which um, make the situation at the border more strict and uh, are planning to check more actively, more attentively, attentively the experts coming from Belarus which they believe is not coming from CS countries, but is of origin from Belarus and is aimed at bypassing sanctions. The next big trend, the second one uh, that we saw continuing in the spring of 2023 is the increased relationship and growing relationship with Russia. Many countries started to look at Russia producing goods made under Russian brands. Belarusian companies want to open companies in Chechnya to make uniform for Russian military forces. The support of Russia it still seems like being not enough for Belarusian officials, in particular, Mikhail Lukashenko in the spring complained that there are some problems with the receiving 1.5 billion loan for import substitution. Mithi Krutoy, Belarusian investor in Russia, complained that Belarusian goods still cannot compete normally in the Russian market with the goods in, brought into Russia under the gray uh, import schemes. Probably the, th the problem here is that the resources that Belarus is bringing into Russia, like potassium and oil products, do find a place, but the machine building equipment still cannot compete with those coming from China. And uh, those uh, coming from the EU brought under the alternative or more expensive schemes. Without a doubt, uh, food products can be very competitive in Russia. I mean, the Belarusian products. But as we can already said that this is trying to become more active in the far arc, which is also found its reflection in the economy. There were a lot of mutual meetings with Zimbabwe. Belarusian scientists even intend to develop the joint program during space program with Zimbabwe. Foreign Minister of Nicaragua offered to Belarus to start the Dick Nicaragua Canal as an alternative pill to Panama uh, Canal. Economically, all those connections look um, rather laughable and not realistic because it's about quite poor and not very much developed country. The only serious economic success in this direction uh, boiled down to uh, the agreement to sell tractors in Kenya for the sum of $320 million 
but this contract also has certain weak sides because it's not particularly clear how it will be financed and where the money will come for our tractors well we will get our money from our, for our tractors as, as to the trends in the domestic economy here i can also single out three main trends first we see the continuation of the trend that started in the winter 2022 our trend uh, of the uh, economy being rebuilt because the economy is getting adapted to the sanctions uh, in uh, being affected by no new shocks the next next big trend in the spring is the trend uh, on show showing the immigration and what is happening in our demographic situation and the third classical trend is that the growing um, measures in the internal economics uh, and state regulation as far as the domestic economy in the march and april as was forecast earlier the economy started to uh, grow compared to the same month the previous year compared to the march 2022 the growth was was seven and four percent compared to april of 2022 but the current level of economic growth is still lower than the levels that those the economy achieved in 2021 about 2.5 percent lower the main driver of the economic growth in spring was the processing industry in march uh, gave significant 10.6 uh, percent while in april uh, the figures were lower but it did stimulate the growth in the transportation industry which no longer became an anti leader while several months ago the transportation industry showed the minus 14 minus 19 percent growth compared to the previous year now it's about zero and it also gave a boost of, i mean the growth of the process industry gave boost to our trade which for a long time was in the depression and the main entry leader of the growth is still the it sector we must note however that the processing industry success is not uh, that uh, simple because we uh, have more goods kept in the stored in the warehouses similar to what we saw in 2022 2021 when we did not close down for the quarantine we kept producing goods in 2020 we were lucky to sell those goods what will happen now is a good question because we have 75 percent of the annual of the monthly production rate stored in the warehouses in april the real salary of those again continued to grow have, in april was 9.6 percent more than the previous year it uh, was more than the, the level of the 2021 and uh, started to give hopes for the growth of the retail sector another interesting effect of the current recession is that while in the past with all the possible external shocks the difference between the minsk and britain was still growing whatever happened now we witness the inequality between the regions and the capital being not so obvious while a year ago Minsk has all earned uh, on average seven percent more than those in regions now they earn uh, earn five to six percent more uh, people which is expressed by the fact that the average salaries are uh, growing while the it sector salaries are going down which still are concentrated in minsk Another trend is demographic demographic trend. Demo demographic trends are very uh, they fluctuate constantly and give us a negative addition to the 
economic growth. Demographic trend is always uh, outside the attention of uh, various analysts and mass media because there's no so drastic no drastic change we continue losing one percent of workforce every year the people the population is getting older since 2017 we, we have been witnessing an immigration trend which became even stronger in 2020 and in 2022 according to the bureau of experts in the last two years the eu countries alone accepted 170 thousands of Belarus, according to the association of Belarusian businesses uh, and abroad over 2000 companies have integrated created from belarus in the last two years as far as the manual management of the economic of the economy is concerned it all looks classic the minister of anti-monopoly monopolic trade anti-monopoly trade said that nobody is going to cancel the system of price regulation because he thinks it's very effective the state continues to support the uh, loss making in enterprises giving loans to the wood processing enterprises cement factories it forces banks to write off that for the BMZ, nothing new here. The new thing here is that in spring, Belarus managed to place bonds, new bonds for several hundreds of million, uh, millions of uh, US dollars, including bonds in Bashtrubos, which means that there's an authorities and Ministry of Finance believes that some Russians will be buying those bonds i would like to remind you that belarus um, announced default on its foreign and bonds and euro bonds in the past and minister of finance many for a long time said there's no default and openly stated that some russian investors even believed that and they in april they tried to come to belarus and get their money they failed but still Belarus is now attracting more money, also doing it from Russians. I I don't think that Russians forgot what happened in the past. I think it's about a new type of assistance from the Russian government. And I will end by saying that in the spring, the government continued to fight the sole proprietors and craftsmen. They decided to review the list of uh, the activities that individual entrepreneurs can take on. But this process is still ongoing. Here I will add, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Lev. And Filip uh, Bikanov, you tell us about the dynamics of the public opinion now. Filip. Uh, thank you very much for attention before i start by uh, speaking i would like to thank uh, katerina barnokova for ins her inspiration for joint work with, with us it was great to work with her and i'm sorry that uh, to know that she will no longer be able to work with us on the, in this project now let's move towards to the trends in the society I already have presentation as always. I will share my screen now. I can see, we can see it very well. Thank you, Philip. As always, our service shows some things and doesn't show others. We'll concentrate on three main trends. We'll talk about uh, trust in the state institutions and people who are against the regime. We'll talk about the trend on leading to the isolation of one of the groups that was single out in the, our survey and about the nuclear weapons and the war. Our survey was conducted online, which means that our sample 
uh, it in, involves people from the urban areas who have access to the internet, people who know about the online panel. Now there was the respondents of the online panel are uh, different to the majority of Belarusians by, by being more active, who can uh, use internet. The factor of fear does influence, but maybe not as much. In, does It does influence the situation. It influences also the selection of a more neutral option. Also, it affects the people who are afraid of participating in this survey. People who are prone to not finishing the survey are affected by this, by this fear. Particularly when we tell, uh, ask people questions about this, the regime, about the state and authorities. And the main thing that we need to remember, the figures that you will see are, is not the clear cut representations of the phenomenon spreading in, in the society. This is this are figures about the trends and tendencies, about the various groups in society. When we say that 90% of people want something to happen, it means that this is uh, what this trend is showing. It allows us to showcase the certain trends inside the, the groups we single out, but it doesn't mean that we can uh, say exactly how many people support Lukashenko or don't. As per one, A year has passed since the, our tracker was launched. Uh, one year later, we can compare the volumes of the segment in terms of its trust towards the, re the regime. We can see that compared to March 2023, there is no dynamics, minus 0.6% compared to the reference figure, it shows that the growth that we were witness for the whole year, I mean the trust towards the regime and institutions, it slowed down. We'll be able to say if it's stopped entirely in, in the next quarter, but now we have the same figures differing by 0.5 percent. What's important to say that compared to the May in 20, 2022, we only see the growth by eight percentage point. The structure of the sample changed a little bit, but it's important to know that in the last year of the information dominance and repression and the citizens affected by the propaganda, particularly by the Russian propaganda and the promotion of the narratives that work on the fear of Belarusians before the war, it allowed to increase this trust towards the Belarusian authorities by a small number. Well, let's go next. When we talk about the, these dynamics, we usually have four. We must understand that it's uh, not precise, but we divide it by four groups. People who are support Lukashenko, rather support him, oppose and rather oppose. 
we see that over the last 12 months, the split between the nuclear parts of the, the social conflict almost never, almost didn't change. We see the social distance is quite long and we can clearly say that the split is there. The split that was there in the past, the split very well reflects the war. But the new trend, which is bore, uh, which is that we noticed in the previous period, uh, the people who are against the regime, uh, there's a trend uh, for its isolation from a different group that is not part of the Belarusian system, that is not feel itself as a beneficiary of this Belarusian state. Like people who are in, inclined to support the regime. The beneficiaries here means that they don't feel that the state works for them. They're not so sure of it. If we look at this table, we'll see that the groups that uh, are trusted by the groups opposing the regime, the group prone to distrust in the regime, receives more trust. At the same time, when we look at the other dimensions, we see that the distance here to the people who oppose the regime actively is the same as to those supporting the regime actively. The agenda of these people and their views are moving are far away from those who oppose and don't like the regime. This is a hypothesis, but we have what we have. And I suspect that this data is, uh, is true. People exist in various echo chambers. This is how it's explained. We have mentioned this before. We asked the question similar to that asked by Livada, and we, without mentioning the word Russian, we asked people to name several bloggers and journalists. Whom you follow. And we made a groups of types, different kinds of bloggers. So Belarusian non-state, Belarusian pro-state, Russian non-state, it's all uh, very much described in the written version of our report. We see that the people who oppose the, to the Belarusian regime watch uh, a lot of uh, Russian Ukrainian bloggers, but and uh, they often say that it's difficult for, for, for them to answer this question. And it shows that many people in Belarus are interested in the media space. Russia. This leads to the depolitization of the group who are prone to distrust the regime and the growing numbers of, of social optimism that we noticed the previous quarter. Also, another important, uh, interesting picture is with echo chambers. Chenham House asked the question, what do you think? Whether, would you agree with 
um, war must will stop when Ukraine achieves its goal, when Russia achieves its goals, and uh, when the compromise is found. The majority of the people supported the status quo, but each of the groups believes that it's in the majority, in the significant majority. Only 14% said that answered about Ukraine, but they believe 70% of people think like them. Only 25% said the war must or stop after Russia achieves this goal. It shows the different effects of this trend. And this trend has been around for many years and it's not going to change. Only now it will have affect the further isolation of the group of the eager opponents of the regime. A few words about the war. No significant changes in the trends related to the war. The change is minor. Nothing super significant there. I don't think that next quarter there'll be any significant change either, but I'm not sure yet. As far as the support of the war and to war consensus are concerned, and to war consensus is quite strong. Almost nothing affects it. The distribution is quite interesting here. The support of this or that uh, attitude to the war is correlates very much to the attitude of regime of Lukashenko. Support of this or that side of the war correlates very much with the support of uh, In other words, when you say that you support Russia in the war, uh, means that there's a big chance that you're supporting Lukashenko and the other way around. People who are actively against the regime and those that actively support the regime, the majority of them, more than 85%, as far as I remember, they also say that the military must not participate in the war, take part in the war in any of the sides. The last thing I wanted to tell you, to fit the timeline that we have to tell, we researched a very relevant topic like support of the nuclear war. We asked people several questions. We made several statements and asked if they agree or disagree. Here we see the following picture. Even among the, the groups that are inclined to support the regime or the eager supporters of the regime, don't have a cons conceptual agreement with the state narrative. Because part of the Lukashenko's narratives that he is guarantor of the Belarus's peace. And the statement was that I welcome the, uh, the placement or deployment of Russian nuclear weapons in Belarus. Even the active supporters of Lukashenko's regime do not agree with that in their majority. And the eager opponents uh, mostly agree that deployment of nuclear weapons of Russia and Belarus is bad. Chatham House also surveyed this opinion and this question. 75% that do not support, or rather not support, the deployment of the nuclear weapons in Belarus. Anti-nuclear consensus in Belarus also exists, and is a significant part of the anti-war consensus. 
the Belarusian state and Alexei Lukashenko actively breaking this are actually breaking this consensus, claiming that the nuclear weapons in Belarus is very good. We can forecast that eager supporters of the regime will be changing their point of view to the one more correlated with the state outlook. Now, uh, more than half of them is disagrees with the deployment of Russian nuclear weapons in Belarus. And they don't want to be part of the war. This is something that unites the eager opponents and eager supporters of the regime. Even people who are inclined to support Russia, they uh, much uh, few of them are ready to support the deployment of Russian nuclear weapons in Belarus, which is very telling about the resilience of the Russian uh, society to the propagandist narratives promoted by the Russian and Belarusian state media, and which covers the majority of the Belarusian society. Thank you. That's it from me. Thank you, Philip. The relations between the society and uh, the authorities will be presented by uh, Gennady Korshnov. Thank you. I will tell you something about the, about the relationship between the society and the, the authorities, the state and the society. I will not be that optimistic. The trends are not optimistic. But it's always it's been always like this. I hope something will change soon. So the peculiarity of this uh, rip of the period is that the main trends that we celebrated out in the past, they continued. Some trends became uh, tougher, some became, uh, more different, became more differentiated and something new appeared. First, the repression, uh, not slowing down. So we can say that format of the authorities in this direction is similar to the actions of the occupation administration in the sense that the, the background, the repressions are ongoing systematically. The repression appear as the reaction to certain events. In this reporting period, there were more than enough of such events. Mainly those were maturish incidents the blow up of the the Russian airplane, which uh, uh, created a big wave of uh, repressive influence, which uh, covered the whole country. And the coverage was large scale, not only territory in terms of territory, but in terms of social groups. There were checks and detentions of people who were detained in the past, the traditional move of the regime, and the coverage of the more and more people, like strike ball, owners of drones, reconstructors, and so on and so forth. In the March, Lukashenko honestly said that a new stage of repression was beginning. The regime of the hardcore cleansing. This had its effect because, according to the reports of um, Gubopik, or main director of fight anti-crime uh, service, showed that uh, daily they uh, tackled about 60 people. So in spring, the 
Spring became uh, the most, uh, the biggest number of people detained compared to the previous year. In March was the record figure, over 600 people. In April, oh, over 300 people. In May, again, 40, about 400 detentions. So the spin of this year became uh, record-breaking in terms of repression. But the problem is that not only the pressive machine, the pressive machine, what works only, not only at the level of detentions. The second trend was well known in the past, but now it's openly seen that, really seen that the people are kept in the worst conditions. The, those practices were highlighted and have been highlighted for a long time by the human rights lawyers, but after the, I would say, in spring, there was the toughening of conditions uh, on, in which people were kept in prisons by two counts. First, as the regime of information isolation for political prisoners, or the so-called incommunicado, when not only information channels were cut off, not only people were uh, not given the ability to write, to make communication with outside world. The people, the detainees were placed in the solitaire confinement company and the, the contacts through lawyers, defense lawyers were also cut off. But, and uh, we see less and less lawyers, a few and fewer lawyers uh, who work with political prisoners. The second trend is, the, is that uh, there's uh, more difficult to get access to medical uh, assistance in the prisons. The problem has always been there, had always been there, but starting from April, the prisons decide not to or reject medical parcels for, for prisoners. They refer to a certain uh, document which has not been actively, uh, openly published. The third trend already mentioned in part today is a further tightening of control. We have mentioned this a number of times in the previous trackers about the control becoming more total in its nature when more and more spheres of life were being covered by the state or tightened by the state. Now we see three such directions. First one is the uh, the legal field where several legal acts were, uh, were introduced. Uh, the KGB now has the ability to stop any citizen from leaving the country. And uh, students of uh, foreign universities will no longer uh, get postponement of the, from the draft. And the medics, will have to work for the state, not two years, but five after they finish their studies in the medical university. And also the, there was a capital punishment reduced for, uh, for state prison, state treason for uh, people working in the government. Also, potentially disloyal citizens are additionally controlled. People who took part in the protest in 2020 using the phones are also controlled further. There are plans to increase sixfold the number of CCTV cameras and preparation of special forces to work with drones in Belarusian cities. 
Separately, those are small bricks, but they build a very tough system that is added by the following steps, leading to the control of the whole site. This is a distant future, but it shows where, it, where it's all going. It's a tightened control over the internet. The curators of the student groups will be controlling the student's use of the internet. An attempt to control the family relationship and the prohibition of the child-free societies. We mentioned a couple of presentations ago that the state is acting more uh, actively there and a desire to create a system of social purposefulness, like Ms. Kachanova mentioned. Basically, this is what uh, the China is doing now. Uh, thus, the system of uh, social control is building up or shaping into something cumbersome, huge, and uh, pressurizing. Interesting. The third direction of the control, as already mentioned by the colleagues, is the border control. Indeed, there's something to talk about here. But I singled out the groups of the citizens who uh, paid special attention at the border. Basically, the regime is afraid of many things, a particular threats coming from abroad. Bushes may not uh, get loud into the country. This is a phenomenon, phenomenon which is unprecedented in the world history, but particular attention is paid to Ukrainians, which is understandable. Belarusians who were in the database, special database, uh, who are put in the register, registry, and Belarusians who cross the border without visas or who have permanent citizens or residents of another state. They are actively checked. Another group. although there's not much information here, the people who live in use and humanitarian visas. A lot of questions are asked of these. And uh, there are a few things that I want to mention, but I suggest you read it in the report. Thank you, Gennady. In the chat, you can find the full copy of the, our report, the Russian Tracker. Also, the report will be sent to all the people who got registered for this seminar. I will now have a, a brief Q&A session. The first question will appear in the chat from Yuri Drakahrust. The question to Philip Bikanov. There's a change in 0.46 percent. Uh, what does it mean across the board? Look, this the change uh, in two segments that are eager to trust the government is very telling. The sum of these changes and uh, it mounted to minus 46, 0.46%. And this was the same way we calculated the change for the year. Thank you, Philip. Any more questions? You can raise your 
hand. You can write it in the chat. Katerina Brankova is asking the question. She's asking Lvov, which trend will show when the Snapkovs and Krutoy fears will realize about the competition with China? Basically, these fears have already implemented. They got implemented in the first few months of the war. If we talk about the equipment of the machine building goods at the beginning of the war, they started, in, uh, started conquering the Russian market at first, but later, because of the number of accidents, for example, Belarusian uh, buses started to caught catch fire. The, some contracts where the Belarusians were broken were cancelled, and uh, China took the place of Belarusians. Belarusians. So that's why Belarus, Mr. Kurtoy is complaining. Will uh, Russia make a step forward, meet Belarus halfway, and stop banning parallel import? I doubt that. On the one hand, it wants to help Belarus. On the other hand, it makes it increases the problems of Russian producers by making their purchases even more difficult. So it would be more e simple if Russia has Belarusian regime through other channels and not by forcing Moscow and Petersburg to purchase Belarusian buses, passenger buses. Thank you, Lev. Any more questions? Since there are no more questions, I uh, uh, would like to ask experts if somebody wants to make a conclusion or as a person who didn't talk about that, I would say that we would really like Katerina Burdukova. We are already missing her and we hope that Katya will be asking us questions during every presentation that will follow this one. And this way we'll see that uh, you are with us following our thoughts. I will support Artyom and all other colleagues. Although I, I think that will be cooperating. Maybe we'll have joint projects in the future. Thank you. Right, at this uh, touch and note, I think we should stop. Katerina will be waiting for you and all our participants and experts at the presentation of this next report. And I would like to thank those people presented today. I would like to thank our listeners. Until next time, see you next time. Thank you. Goodbye.